standard, huh? Again, I expect a little bit smaller group here because of, uh, again, a little bit more specialized of, of how to run the system. But uh, I'll go ahead and talk about optimizing the camera uh, workflow and things like that at this point. So uh, things we've already done at this point is um, we have, um, let me go ahead and see if I can find my mouse. Come on. There we go. There we go. Cool. Uh, so again, I'm running this remotely from uh, from New Jersey to uh, to Columbus. Uh, things we've already done at this point is basically just tilted the sample. Um, we have it at around, I think, six nanoamps, which is around half the beam current uh, of, the, of, the, of the beam current spec. And then uh, the, the system is inserted. So again, always be careful when inserting because, you know, there's 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 always a danger of, of, of crashing into something if something is not expected to be. Uh, in general, I will tell you that there is um, uh, there's a there's a stop button here. So you can when you put the detector in, you can stop it here. Uh, you can also t stop it in this detector position, and then also a button pops up over here that acts as a little bit closer stop button. So there are three stop buttons if you need to stop it. So uh, again, if something does go wrong, you just push the magic stop button, and hopefully before you crash into something. A uh, thing of note is that somebody has crashed into something because you can see uh, there's a little bit of damage to the phosphor screen. Uh, in general, that's not a problem. The background will mainly take care of it. And more importantly, Kikuchi lines will just go through it. Uh, so you have a little bit less intensity, but honestly, this this is probably doesn't matter. Um, usually, if a phosphor screen is damaged and it's going to matter, um, the most common one I see is what I call the Nike swoosh, uh, which is where people rub the side with their hand on it, and you get like this this curved kind of uh, what I, again like literally like a Nike swoosh um, from where they rub it on their hand when they're moving inside the microscope. Um, but uh, again, this is not a problem. So again, this is the Hikari system. Uh, this is the uh, the CCD based. If we look down here. Uh, we have uh, we have binning, we have gain, and we have exposure. Uh, the big thing to realize here is that these all play off of each other. Um, and what I mean by that is right now, let me go ahead and lower my gain a little bit. We're going to see this value right here. Uh, what this value is, is this is uh, basically a camera saturation index. Um, and what this is, is basically uh, the, 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 the well depth of, of uh, the highest pixel in the camera. So right now, the uh, the dynamic range of this is we're using 30% of the max dynamic range uh, of, of this camera. So if I increase my gain, we will see it'll go up. And at some point, I will actually saturate. So you can see that at this point here, uh, probably around uh, 50, 50 or so, um, I'm going to saturate this at, at around uh, 1. And of course, it doesn't go above the value of 1, just more and more pixels get, get saturated. Now. For the highest quality data, uh, you want this to be around 0 0.8. Uh, why? Um, it's kind of arbitrary, uh, but we're, honestly, the issue is with, with some orientations and some samples, if uh, if you have like a multi-phase sample, um, you'll have 20% variance on this. So it'll go above 100% and you'll have a maxed out. To be completely honest with you, if you have a, um, uh, if you have a, that's indexable. In fact, let me go ahead and kind of prove it to you. Without a background, without anything, uh, this is oversaturated on about a you know, quarter of the phosphor screen, and I'm going to assume this is going to be probably indexable. Boom. Look, no problem at all. So here again, you can see my, my CI is a little on the low. My fit's not that great, but that's the correct orientation solution for this um, because, again, it, it doesn't need that information to do that. Uh, in fact, let's see what the lines are finding. Oops. So this right here turns on the huff lines. Um, and I can actually see it's it's this. these are probably bad. So um, this one's real. This one's real. Oops, I gotta go a little bit slower because there's some lag here. So this is this this is one's real. Uh, this one's real. I think this is bad. I think this is bad. Uh, but I have enough lines that it still gives me a correct orientation solution. And again, I can see that because the orientation solution is finding lines like this one right here um, that is, is is basically not being used for the indexing routine, but still there. Uh, so again, even with this unbackground corrected, uh, completely blown out in a third of the phosphor screen, it's still perfectly indexable. So let's go ahead and talk about how these kind of work together. Well, let me go ahead and turn this down to a little bit more of a reasonable level. In fact, um, go pretty far down. Oops, I need to be more patient because our good old friend lag. So as I load this down, you can see that value changes, and right now I'm down to around 0.25. So right now my camera binning is four by four. What that means is I'm basically taking a 16 pixel area, four by four, and uh, adding those together to make uh, one big megapixel, so to speak, 
of, uh, of, of area one color or one intensity. If I change this, let's say eight by eight, we're gonna see this go up by a lot because now instead of 16 pixels, I'm doing 64 pixels. So now at eight by eight binning, uh, go ahead and click on this. Uh, you're gonna see the binning is way up. Now this is actually saturated. So I went basically up by a factor of four. Um, and also you can see the pattern quality gets not that much worse because you don't really lose that much definition. But again, it does get worse when you when you do that. So now you can see, oops, I just took a bad background on accident, or I turned a bad background on, excuse me. None. Oops, just trying it. Sorry guys, a little, little bit of lag from New Jersey to Ohio. So again, you can see now this is max. So what I would do now is you see, I changed my binning to lower binning. Now with this being this high, what I could do is I could lower the, expo I could lower the exposure to go faster. So now instead of 400 frames, I could probably lower this down to something like, you know, something like that. Or I could, you know, I could actually increase my gain. And I could lower this exposure a little bit more. Oh, I have a question. What version of Hikari is this? Do you know what version of Hikari this is? Pro Plus or Super? Oh, I got Dan's mouse. He can't unmute himself. Can I unmute Dan? And eh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, right now, you can see my frame rate's locked, and I'm, I'm I'm thinking that this is uh, uh because this is actually uh, the uh, the lower version of the Hikari. Um, but you can see that in general that you can, uh, you know, this, this is kind of how this goes, where I can bleed off frames uh, and go faster frames by, by going bidding. In general, again, I usually do most of my work either 8x8 eight eight or 4x4 four four, uh, on this guy. Let's try it. Okay. Okay, Roger, are you here? My sales guy's hiding behind the scenes here. I wonder if you can hear me. This is a little lower than I would expect uh, for his frame rate on this guy, but it works. Um, so again, there's kind of this playoff here between this. Now, what I'm actually uh, going to do this is I'm going to, there's no reason for me to be uh, this bad pattern quality uh, for what I'm doing. So I'm going to go to four by four right now. I'm going to lower my gain because there's no reason to, to probably have this high of gain. No, but I'm going to go slower in this case. I'm going to go to, um, let's say, somewhere around there. Now, you can see here that this is a nice high value. You can see I'm I'm kind of, you can kind of see maybe this pulsing a little bit because my scanning is currently going on on the microscope. So now if I hit this SEM area, it's going to take a background. And here you see that it takes a background. And I go ahead and turn this background on. Uh, this is what I should expect for a good background signal. So I can see kind of pretty clear patterns right now. Uh, it's doing what it needs to do. Now, instead, if I used one of these, these optimization routines and click on a smart background, it's going to zoom me out by a factor of four. So if you kind of look down here where this magnification is, uh, there we go. It's currently at a thousand. I'm going to go and click, go ahead and click on a smart background. It's going to zoom us out by a factor of four and then move us back in uh, to a thousand. So it's going to go to 250 and then go back down. Now, depending on how this happens, sometimes you won't actually see a change, but you will see, uh, again, I'm gonna change it. Um, yeah, it, was too, it doesn't do it here in this case. Uh, there it goes to 250, uh, and then it will go back to 1,000. So it zoomed us out, took a new background, zoomed us back in. Again, I usually don't like doing a smart background, uh, which is used with a routine. I just tend to take uh, a more manual background. So now my camera's basically optimized uh, for what I want. Again, I'm just taking a new background here. So now I just kind of click and see what happens. And it's going to go ahead and give me a nice pretty pattern and show me the pattern to index it. Now, right now, it's doing what's called snapshots. So it's doing a snapshot. By default, it averages four frames together for snapshots. You can change this to one if you want, um, because that's going to be more closely to what a map does, right? So if I go down here, change this to four, and go up. So. Uh, here is, uh, go ahead and let me recapture this. Oh, this is not frame average. 
Uh, you can see it's a little worse quality, but you're not going to notice any bigger differences here. Go ahead and click on indexing, and again, there's a good, nice high CI uh, and a nice low fit. So again, it's telling me this is some good information. Now over here, there's a couple different options. This basically indexes it. Uh, this toggles off and on the indexing solution itself. You can see that they match. This is kind of what you want. And this toggles the overlay off. Now this right here is a perfect example of vertical bias and why I like my vertical bias to be a little bit higher. So when I'm doing something like this, what I will do is I'll hop over here and I'll pop this out. Remember I talked about all these stupid clicks earlier on? Scroll down, click on Huff. Scroll down again, click on full display. Now in Apex, that's one click. And that's why I like this. So now you can see, again, this is my Huff display. Here's my max band count. This is at uh, two degrees theta. Uh, what I want is this vertical bias. And I'm gonna take this vertical bias here and click on it. I'm gonna hit my space uh, or my arrow key three times to go one, two, three. And you can see that move some of these points up here to higher up. So I'm trying to get away from this cluster up here. Uh, give, give me a little bit better uh, resolution over the over the whole area. Um, so this is, is 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 what we want. We want to get a more kind of over here. And in fact, um, maybe on something like this, what's our working distance? I didn't say. Uh, but something like this, I could even go maybe a little bit more because again, I want a little bit more coverage over the full area. And you can see that I moved like the ones that were down here are now no longer there. The other thing here you can see is um, this uh, where is that this row fraction. So this row fraction does is it brings away um, from the outside. So you can see that where I'm cutting off like this over here and this up here, that's actually the outside of the pattern. Uh, this row fraction basically says, hey, throw out the, the outside 15%. Now, the other thing to really notice here is, remember how there's phosphor screen damage? You really can't see it anymore. Um, it, it, it's there, it's just damaged, but you're, it's not actually impacting the quality of the pattern uh, or the indexing results. So again, some damage is okay, just don't make it a big giant line. Again, the other thing that I would change here is maybe max peak count. If I was doing something like uh, like a, again, a hex-based system, I might move this up to nine or 10 instead. Or again, the other things I would work over here would be like, um, that's pretty much it. I, I almost never, these, these top four here, almost have never had a reason to use this. Peak symmetry didn't co come into common with like maybe like a graphite um, where your bands aren't quite symmetrical, but again, you're, you're almost never gonna see that. Now, if you mess up with all these, you don't know what to do, just go ahead and click on restore defaults. In fact, I can see right now that somebody has been with this because this is on the seven by seven and the restore defaults should should take this back to nine by nine. So here you can see the defaults here, nine by nine, uh, 96 uh, binning, eight, eight theta one, and then of course a row fraction, 85. Again, I like this to be three. Now, what I'm getting set up for a map, uh, I, I kind of like would see if I can get good speeds on something like this. And right now I can say, hey, these patterns are actually way overkill. Um, so if I go ahead and like click here, I can see I get good patterns in the top left. And I click here, top right, click over here. I can see I get good patterns in the top uh, over there, over here. And this is just kind of me double checking to say, hey, how good of a job is it doing um, indexing in, in the corners? Now, what I'd usually do if I'm doing a true map, and this is gonna be a little bit hard here, is um, if I click and drag, you can see the pattern changes and follows the mouse. This is not a good way to see if something's gonna index well, uh, because you as a human, you, your eye kind of does like frame averaging as you go. So you actually may, it shows good patterns all the time, but a map has gotta be everywhere. So usually if you're doing a map, I do what I call a flick test, and I kind of go here in the middle, and I have no idea how this would work on the internet, and I kind of like flick it up towards the corner. Say, okay, yep, good pattern. Do it again. They say, oh, good pattern. Now, again, this is a real world sample. Uh, again, it looks like somebody sneezed on it, uh, but I can see there's a scratch here. Let's see if I can actually show you the scratch. Did I lose quality patterns? Might not be big enough. It should be big enough for me to see it. I'm very surprised it doesn't pop up more. What about the goo? There we go. Here you can see the. Uh, uh, the goo. So the goo there is is blocking my signal and I'm not going to be able to map over here. So again, don't seize on your samples. It's bad for it. There we go. And here you can also see there's some shadowing here because of the uh, um, the topography in the scratch. I got a feeling this might actually index. It would be kind of neat um, to show. 
So again, that's all this. If I had to do like a special background, I could go to this image processing tab, and I could go down here, and instead of this, I could say do a uh, do a custom background, and then when I click on modify, it lets me basically do whatever I want. So now I could say let's go ahead and do a, a static background contraction. Let's go ahead and maybe let's go ahead and do a dynamic background division. And you can see that it really kind of changes the pattern quite a bit, a little bit oh, much more contrast because of the background that I choose. Again, perfectly indexable on the right. No real difference here and here, but it just makes it look prettier. Now again, some samples you're gonna to have to do this if you need to, have to do it with like a, a single crystal or a very strongly textured sample. The other thing to realize here is that uh, order does matter. So right now I'm doing a, a subtraction followed by a division. If I move this division up, uh, I get different results. So again, be aware that these uh, that these do matter in the order that you do them in. Uh, in general, you should do uh, subtractions before divisions. There are other higher level like things over here, but there's really no reason for you ever to do this high low pass filtering or either medium smoothing filter. These are basically stuff that over the last you know, 30 years of Enax's life, we've customers have said, oh, hey, this would be useful when we added it, uh, but you know, maybe for, for a single application kind of thing. Cool. Okay. Anything to talk about there? No, I think we're good. Uh, this distortion correction down here is, I guess, something you probably should never mess with. Uh, this is, is made for uh, uh, basically uh, some older microscopes used to have a little bit of, of remnant magnetism in the actual uh, chambers themselves, and it's allowed us to correct for that. Um, nowadays, microscopes are are, are 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 very precise, and because of that, you can't really have a, a remnant magnetic field from the chamber itself, uh, so you don't really have to worry about a, a distortion correction because, uh, because of that. Uh, this is where you, uh, again, put the um, camera in. Again, it should always basically all the way in. Another stop button, and of course, here's the touch sensor. So if something does touch uh, the uh, the thing, it actually has a touch sensor built into it. Um, it'll trigger it if it's grounded, uh, and it'll automatically pull itself out. That's where you reset that. Uh, this is actually uh, where you control the FSD. Um, so down here, you can see I can change this right here. If I pull this down, I could pull it down, and you can see it has the FSD available to me, uh, and I could go ahead and end up fiddle with the FSD controls. Uh, the FSD controls themselves are, um, sorry, I don't, I, last time I actually used a Hikari is probably about a year ago. Uh, here's the FSD controls, uh, and here is where it gets really tricky. You can see there's four sliders here, and these make it very difficult to uh, um, to really uh, do uh, good uh, good imaging here. This is, again, why Prius is so nice. Uh, so again, this is our gain and offsets for, FS, for the FSD, and also for the scan generator. So you can see it goes from camera, FSD scan generator to you, and there's a little instruction manual over here on how to best do this. And I'm not going to cover this, and I'll tell you just to, to use, use Prius instead if you really want to do this. Um, beyond that, uh, that's kind of the uh, the basics uh, of, the, uh, of the camera setup. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit uh, about mapping. So here's my mapping tab here. You can see it's a full area map. If I could, I can actually shrink this down. Uh, but uh, it's a little bit difficult I think, to drag from here. Uh, the other thing I could do is I could change my mode here. So I go over here and I do mode. I can go ahead and switch this to things like freeform, where I could go ahead and say, uh, let me just do this area here. That's not too bad considering what lag I have. Uh, and we can say, hey, uh, this is what I want to do with my EVSD map on. So then it just scans over this. Uh, again, it's not perfect because the way the scan generator works, but it does save some time by by avoiding areas um, that you may uh, may not want to do EVSD on. Uh, besides that, of course, this is also where I do combo scan. I'm not going to cover combo scan uh, here. Uh, combo scan in here is a little bit trickier than, than an Apex, so I don't want to kind of double dip too much there. This is where I choose my step size between, uh, again, coarse, medium, and fine. Uh, again, it's basically the same thing where it's choosing the amount of amount of uh, pa uh, points it's going to do. Uh, in general, again, the main thing I told you guys the difference here is is I don't really have the option of, of telling how long this is going to be. So if I do a media map, I don't really have an idea until I click on, on go uh, how how long this is going to go. So we go ahead and change this back to um, to our good old friend normal with normal in mind. Let's go ahead and actually just uh, start up. Oh, we missed normal. 
let's see, what am I missing? I did not set a phase list. So I talked about that lookup table earlier. So that lookup table is going to be based off of my phase list. There's two ways to open up the phase list. One is to click on phase list. The other is going to be pick, click on this profile button. I usually just click on this profile button. And when I do that here, you can see here's my phase list, here's my, my, my keyword search, and all this kind of stuff. You can see there's less optionality here, uh, functionality here uh, than this. So in this case here, it's nickel. But let's say I had ferrite. I can go ahead and search for ferrite. And over here, you can see, hey, you now it's doing ferrite. I would click on this, I would click on, on this, and it'll be over here on this list. If I wanted to remove it, I had to go back here and do that. I had to click on here, click on um, you know, remove phase, and then I'd go ahead and remove the phase. Again, in Apex, I can just basically just turn it on and off and up here without actually removing it from the active phase list, which is highly, highly useful. Also, again, we do have other databases. Um, they're a little bit, oops, that's not what I wanted. What am I doing here? Do, do, do. It's over here in the search tab. Uh, you can see that right now you're searching the TSL database. Uh, you can also basically turn on the AMCS database or your own database here. Again, if you have the ICDD or the ICSD, uh, they can also be added here. So right now, this is my nickel. I go ahead and click on this. We can see that a lot of parameters are set up. 3.56, I drag this around. Again, we can see where my atomic positions are and all that kind of good stuff. So at this point, let's go ahead and close this. And let's go ahead and just start a map. So now the map is starting. Uh, again, we got a raster up here from left to right. And it is probably running at this point, but uh, the step size is relatively small. There we go. We can start to see it fill in here. Uh, looks like a relatively strongly uh, textured sample. At least there's a couple of grains here. And I can see I have different different colors, different orientations based off of what phase I am. Down here is what I call the smiley face. I can see I have this, this, and the smiley face. Uh, the smile here is going to be what we call CI through time. So the, right now we can see this is nice and green. Uh, basically, each one of these is like a little slice is row average CI. So we take the CI average for the row and then go ahead and basically make a color slice for this. Uh, often what I would see this is sometimes I will see like a, a bad CI, a good CI, a bad CI. Uh, it's often pretty common at low mag if like I don't have dynamic uh, focus on. So I basically go into focus and out of focus and into focus again or, or other way around, um, which is uh, pretty common. I can click off. Right now I have the IPF map on top. This is my color, uh, color one. Now I can see the IQ map underneath. So this right here is the IQ map. Uh, underneath here. So again, we can see it's it, it's charging or shift a little bit uh, versus the initial image. This is my inverse pole figure. I also can do IQ map as color. And of course, CI map as color. So CI map is telling me where I'm doing a good job indexing uh, versus uh, basically maybe a little less, less of a good job. Here I can see I'm doing a good job like in the uh, over here. Uh, green bound, like here's those scratches. I'm doing a bad job because uh, I'm getting a lower CI because Again, I have uh, either shadowing or, or, or other things going on here. But honestly, you can see that I'm doing a pretty good job in general. I'm not dropping too many grain boundaries here because there are two things here because it's just a scratch. So here you can see I'm missing one pixel here. I'm missing two pixels from this scratch. Another thing I can do is if I close my profile on my project tree down here, I click on this. This will show me um, the pattern real time. So I can see the pattern updating real time. I can also can see that this right here will show me the crystal real time so I can see uh, what the crystal is doing. Now with this over here, I click on it once. It'll show me the index solution. I click on it again, it'll show me what the Huff is doing. So I can see, hey, is the Huff doing a good job, getting good coverage or not? And again, I, this feels a little low to me, but it is what it is. Also, I can see here uh, that I'm using a non-standard background. So I'm still using that custom background I set, which I think was basically nothing. So in this case right now, the signal is strong enough that I don't even need a background. So this is actually being run uh, without a background. And I can tell that by the fact that you can see that I still have my, my phosphor screen damage. So this right here is a map. You can see, again, it's being fully done uh, with even out without a background. Sean, can you um, go back and talk again about why those features don't quite seem to line up between the, like the image quality map and the STM image? 
Oh, that's, that's because at some point between when the image was taken and uh, I started the map, the, the, the sample moved. Uh, either I, I don't know if, if Dan moved it earlier and didn't take a new image, which again I honestly don't know, or again um, sometimes uh, sample drift, stage drift, whatever. But I got a feeling here is it, I think the he just moved the field of view slightly. That's all. Yeah, one of the big things to always consider when you're mounting these samples is you are doing a 70 degree tilt. Um, those little friends or little carbon dots are not nearly as 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 as, as sticky as you think they are. Um, and your sample, especially if you're looking at small features, can drift quite a bit physically. And what I mean by that is they're actually moving down. Um, if that's real, that's amazing. What's going on there? Huh. I have never, I, I've probably done a hundred of our nickel samples easily over the years, and I have never seen that. Interesting. I have no idea what's going on there. It looks like it's real to me, but uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, the uh, the reason they're offset here is, is just because of that. It's just the, the imaging in the background um, wasn't refreshed. So you always can take a new image beforehand. And right now, if I stop this and took a new image, um, it's going to line up because that's actually what's happening. Uh, the other reason it could shift sometimes, I, I've seen some shifts like this because um, uh, your sample is magnetic in nature. Uh, so your sample is magnetic in nature. Uh, you know, you put your beam in X, Y position, uh, but um, what really can happen with us is, is again, it might be hitting a specifically different area, or again, we're um, we're an X-ray or, or electron technique. So your X-rays come out if they come out weird uh, of your sample, um, they, they they can actually be bent uh, as they, as they come out. Now you can actually see the distortions and the Kikuchi lines from that. So different than when your beam is actually hitting your sample. Um, it's kind of a different thing, but. Let's see what we got here. Again, nice. Uh, again, you can see the grain boundaries are nice and clean, right? It goes right up to the grain boundary, uh, and it does a good job indexing all the way across the grain boundary. If I turned on the IQ map, we're going to see uh, that the IQ drops pretty strongly along that grain boundary. So here again, you can see that the grain boundary, uh, in this case, green is bad. Uh, you can see that it goes up to the grain boundary, and the, eye quali the image quality gets worse out there. And also, we'll see. The IQ also, or the, Q, the CI also gets worse, so they, uh, they do a good job in general. So here you can see this. Uh, this is this is an amazing sample for for demos. Uh, right here, this sample. I'm not entirely sure this is our nickel sample anymore, by the way. Um, this sample here, this orientation, is having problems. And you see how it's speckling back and forth between two orientations here. Uh, that's usually a pseudo symmetry kind of problem. Uh, our nickel does not have pseudosymmetry, but uh, I, I believe this is our nickel, so I'm not entirely sure what's going on here. Uh, but if I see something like this, I would usually say, okay, uh, what's going on? I would increase the amount of, of bands I'm using. So I don't know if this is defaulted to six or seven bands maybe right now uh, in a seven orientation problem, but you can see this is speckled between two colors. You know, usually telling me uh, that there's a pseudosymmetry problem, and because of that, I'm getting uh, basically a, not quite a coin flip, but um, it is choosing between two solutions. That is interesting. A very fine scale uh, uh, twin here, which is kind of neat. And here you can see again, I'm, there's an inclusion and a scratch and the scratch is not indexing. Now you'd also would notice here that um, sometimes the orientation of the scratch will also kind of in, give you an idea of what's going on with the diffraction. Um, these scratches that kind of cross cut, let me get the diffraction signal out, why the diffraction tends to be a little bit more uh, um, and absorbed by the sample depending on the orientation of the of the actual scratch, but in general, this is a pretty beat up sample. Um, so just again, one of those kind of small things to uh, to consider. Any questions? Cool. Well, let's go ahead and uh, stop this map then. Yeah. So something like this, I I. I Go double check the half off real quick. So, so when I do this, you can see that it says, okay, we have we did 85,000 points. Uh, we did 96% uh, uh, index. It'll also be high CI for all of them. This is what I expect for something like this. So now I click on finish. 
I just want to go over here and double check my huff. Again, enjoy Apex if you have it, because for me to check the huff is going to involve 10 steps. Click number one, click number two. So here you can see it's using eight bands, so I'm very surprised. Now, here's your, uh, here's your phosphor screen damage. So I have a feeling for that pseudosymmetry, it's picking up the phosphor screen because I don't have the, the background on. So you see how this, this red line here is getting picked up as a, um, as a, as a Kikuchi band. It's probably bad. Uh, and because I didn't have the background on, that's doing that. Now let me actually take a back, bad background on purpose. So let me go back to the survey mode. Let me go ahead and capture a background. Go ahead and turn this background on so we actually can see the bad background. This is a bad background, and this is where it gets tricky to know if you have a bad background or not. So if you notice what I did is, is my beam is currently stationary, and I took a background while it was stationary. So what I'm doing is I have my raw signal, I have my background, and I'm subtracting that, that, that background from my raw signal. So it's subtracting itself from itself, it gets rid of it. So right now, if I stay in that same grain or same area, I'm not going to notice uh, that I have a bad background. So right now, uh, my beam is down here. You can see that I can kind of see it in some areas it's not. If I go to a whole, wholly different grain, that's a bad background. So I can see here as I see it, like kind of like a shadow pattern uh, going on uh, in the background. Now here, the pattern is actually strong enough uh, that it doesn't care. Um, so right now, again, we're doing really high quality patterns, but even with a bad background, it's just like, eh, I can still see an orientation on this, and I'm happy enough to give you that orientation. So now you can see I'm kind of this uh, flat face here, uh, orientation. If I actually turn the background off and recaptured, yeah, you can kind of see this already, uh, that it gives me the same orientation. So in this case, even with a bad background, it, it gave me the same orientation uh, with uh, with the bad background versus no background. Again, for a, for a good background, what you'll see here is that this should look like it's pulsating because it's fully scanning. Then I capture the background. Make sure it's turned on here. And now again, you can see that, hey, that, that's a good background. One of the things that's often uh, not misused quite a bit, or not really misused, but um, not utilized enough, I would say, is uh, this tab here, the simulation mode. Uh, this simulation mode can uh, be used as a good teaching tool um, because, you know, how, how good is everybody's crystallography? Um, so here's our crystal. I could say, okay, in this orientation here, let me go a uh, perfect one, 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 so to speak, if I can. Eh, there we go. Here's my perfect one, one, one orientation where I can see again, here's my kind of my triangle. I can see here's my Kikuchi pattern would look like. And I also can see what my inverse pole figures look like here. So again, I can see that it's a one, one, one. If I rotate this to be more of a flat, it's gonna go down towards a zero, zero, one. And then of course, if I go to an edge on orientation, I'm gonna go a little bit more to the um, perfectly edge to edge here. And I go towards that one, zero, one. So again, one, one, zero, one is gonna be edge on, uh, one, one, one is going to be corner on. And then of course, zero, zero, one is flat face. And of course, if you don't know how to do this, you can kind of look at this and also kind of understand the Euler angles a little bit better. So here I can say, okay, here I am again on that one, one, one orientation. If I change um, this guy here, how does it affect it? Oh, or I'm rotating around that axis versus if I change this here, what axis is this rotating around? You can see, oh, hey, that's rotating around that axis instead or versus this axis. So this is a good way of, of kind of saying, okay, what's the, what's the, uh, you know, what's this sample going to look like from patterns to crystal display to pole figures to inverse pole figures? So again, a very good tool uh, of, of teaching you that. Now, unbeknownst to a lot of people here, this is what we call orientation mode, but there's also things like misorientation and confidence index. This confidence index can be very, very good to show you when pseudosymmetry might be a problem. So right now, like here, I can go ahead and say, okay, I'm doing a nickel sample. I'm doing eight bands, and let's go ahead and show me, um, uh, just use the this by default, and say, okay, click on this. And what this is gonna do now 
is it goes over the entirety of orientation space and figures out what do I expect my CIs to be if I use eight bands. So here I can see that the CI fraction of being zero is relatively low and the average CI is relatively high. Now, if I wasn't using enough bands, let's say I went down to six and calculated it, I can see that you know the CI is gonna go down a little bit uh, because honestly, nickel or uh, uh, FCC can be done relatively easily. If I go down to four, I still think even four gives me most solutions for this guy. Yeah, so now I can see there are certain orientations, about 10% of the orientations are not uh, basically will give me unique solutions with uh, with four lines here. So here I can see that here and here, uh, I have a little bit of ambiguity in solutions based on only having four lines. And in fact, if I go to five, it, it goes, it does pretty good at five even. Calculate. So there you go. So again, you can see uh, it's doing better, but there still is an area where the CI fraction is zero. If you have multiple phases loaded, let me go over here real quick to um, profile. And then let me go ahead and add ferrite. If I can spell. Let's go search for this instead. There's ferrite. Go ahead and add ferrite. Okay. Now if I switch this up here to um, what's called phase differentiation, it's going to tell me how easy can it differentiate between these two phases. And then I click on calculate here. It's going to say, hey, what orientations that have problems with these two phases at five bands? So here you can see, hey, there are some areas that between these two phases, uh, it has trouble figuring it out. And of course, I increase my bands and say, hey, we're doing a better job. There we go. So again, you can see this is a higher higher CI and a lower area that has has a zero um, zero percent. When this really matters, though, is when you have things like uh, samples that are going to be very difficult to do, like um, Ferrite Martin site. So I go down here to search. Uh, I add a slightly tetragonal Martin site here to my list. Go ahead and remove my nickel. Click on OK. And now I go ahead and do this phase differentiation between the Ferrite and the Martin site. And you can see it takes a little bit more. There you can see that there's a much larger percentage of area uh, where it has a zero fraction, in this case 0 0.13, and the average CI for everything is going to be 0 0.33. So again, this is a case where, again, we have problems doing those eight bands. And honestly, re repeating this to like nine bands isn't gonna make probably that big of a difference. So let's go to this in nine bands. It'll also take longer to do because it's more computationally heavy. Here you can see this is taking much, much longer to do. So we wait and wait and wait. And then boom, you can see it pops up. Again, a little bit lower fraction here, I think, with this, but the average CI overall didn't really change. So again, these, these are kind of an example of, of why. One way to use something like this is if I'm having a problem with my sample, I can use this as a tool to say, hey, why am I having, having this problem? Maybe if I change the more bands, would it fix the problem or not? Um, see anything else with the Hikari, that's important. See, I'm assuming you guys kind of know the basics of team where again, you can switch modes over here. Um, of course, I open this up and click on it. I can send it to volume analysis, which is what we're going to cover tomorrow. So there's my map. I can click on over here and I click on send to volume analysis. It's going to send it to volume analysis. There's my data. And then we can say, hey, what's this look like? Yep, looks like what we expect. I don't think I see the patterns with this. Yeah, I didn't save the patterns. Let's try to figure out. Yeah. Let's try to figure out why it's bouncing around between two solutions. And it's because I use a bad because I use that bad bat or no background with the damaged phosphorus screen. It's it's picking up bad lines um, around the um, around that because it's that's why it's doing it with this guy. 
Okay, so at this point, I think I'm pretty much done with the Hikari. So any questions, comments, concerns? Uh, this would be the time to uh, to raise your hand and say, hey, Sean. Uh, 